Say good morning, Shore Street, and um, any visitors that that are are worshiping with us this morning. And uh, it's a delight to be able to have this opportunity to worship together. Uh, my name is Colin. Um, most of you will will know me or know us, Colin uh, and my wife Marjorie. And uh, we love these opportunities when we're back in Shore Street um, to to worship. Um, together, even though we're not together physically, we still sense God's spirit amongst us and, and worshiping with us. I want to read some words from Isaiah uh, 42 um, as we come um, to worship, and they're familiar verses, verses that um, are, are well known. Isaiah 42 and verses one to, to four. Here's my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. And the servant here obviously is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is pictured here as carrying to the nations the message that there's only one God, my chosen one in whom I delight. And, and what does the servant do? He brings justice to the nations. And this word justice means his revealed truth. So in a world of bruised reeds and smouldering wicks and a world that's crying out for justice and truth, we declare this morning that God is at work amongst the nations. And what he's doing is that he is sustaining and strengthening and renewing and bringing the revealed truth of God through his Son, by his Spirit, with his full authority to bear upon this world. Incredible uh, picture we get there of what God is doing um, in this world. Let, let, let's come and pray together. Let, let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge this morning that 
you're still a God who's ruling and reigning. Not just in individual lives, but amongst the nations. And we put our hope and trust in the God of the whole world. The God who is renewing and strengthening and holding together his people through his word by his spirit. A God who's ministering um, to the nations, to the far ends of the earth. May we be encouraged as we glimpse the one who has not given up on his world. The God who is bringing truth and help and hope and to bear upon uh, individuals, churches, nations, governments, establishments and those who are at work for justice and for truth. Lord and Cain, encourage us. Lift us up and above and beyond what we see and look upon and hear and to our God at work in your world. Enthuse us, excite us, encourage us, even through these difficult days, that we might see the God of the nations at work amongst the nations, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Evie's going to lead us in some worship this morning. Hi everybody, let's worship. We're going to sing a song called We Need an Awakening, which we learned closer to the start of lockdown. So. Oh 
Thank you, Evie, for, for leading us in um, a wonderful song that just reminds us that um, we can cry out to God that he would rise up uh, amongst the nations uh, and uh, reveal himself, uh, something of his power and the truth of his word um, that would rest um, uh, upon us. Um, uh, the last time I was preaching here, I, I spoke from uh, the Lord's Prayer about the importance of bread and how asking God for daily bread creates within us a daily dependency on God. Uh, and this time, this morning, I want to speak about suffering. I know it's not the most comfortable subject to talk about, but it is something that Marjorie and I witness uh, almost every day where, where we live and where, where we serve. And I think because of the pandemic, we're all wrestling with this issue of suffering. And we're, we're trying to make sense out of suffering in the world that we live in whether that's in the UK or Europe or the Middle East or Asia or America. So we're, we're going to explore this issue this morning and allow the Bible to shape our response to suffering. So let me read a passage to you from Luke 13, verses 1 to 5. And these are striking words, words that almost shock us. And I wonder, are these the words that you would use to comfort people who are struggling to make sense of a, of a suffering and a, a, a tragedy. Look, um, 13 um, verses um, one, uh, 1 to 5. Luke 13 um, verses 1 um, to 5. And this is God's word. It's his living word. It is the truth and the power to transform uh, and to change lives. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower and Siloam fell in them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Amen. By the time that we have finished this sermon, statistics tell us that 7,000 people will have died a violent death around the world. Two dozen women will have been raped. A hundred and ninety children will have been abused. Sixty people will have died of various diseases. And these statistics are only the tip of the iceberg. But as many of us know, suffering is not just a statistic. At some point in life, if it hasn't already, suffering will happen to you. It will affect you and it, as it affects Christians and non-Christians, men, women, children, the wealthy, the poor, the powerful, the weak, the intelligent, the less intelligent. And suffering will affect us all, spiritually, physically, emotionally, and probably all three, if the truth be known. So the first thing I want to say this morning is that how you react to suffering will determine how you will cope with suffering. People often react in two ways. It's either denial or, or an acceptance. And many people react to suffering in this world by denying God's existence. The question often on the lips of people is, well, if God really exists, then he would have done something about the violence and the hurt and the pain and the suffering and the sickness in this world that he has created. Another way of dealing with suffering and evil is to say, OK, I believe God exists, but I don't believe for one moment that he's a good God. Because if he was a good, powerful God, then he would have been willing and able to stop suffering. He hasn't, so he's definitely not good, and he's certainly not powerful. But the truth of the matter is denying that God exists or saying he's not good doesn't get rid of the questions about suffering. In fact, it leaves us with even more questions. Questions like then, who deals with the people who create and commit injustice? and violence, and murder, and child abuse, and, and, and rape, which results in suffering. Who's going to deal with these things? Who's going to ensure that those who have suffered will get the justice that we long for, for ourselves and for our loved ones? Governments, courts, and police in countries around the world don't always get it right. But the Bible assures us that we do not live in a godless world. Acts 17, 31, for he 
God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So if God does not exist, then there can be no justice. But also if God does not exist, then there can be no future. Without God, this life and all the suffering is all that there is. Can you imagine that for one moment? You suffer, you die, that's it. End of story. Without God, that is the way it would be. But again, the Bible reminds us of a God who lives forever. A God who offers us eternal life. John eleven twenty five. Jesus clearly and powerfully says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And so if we deny God's existence and say that he's not good, then we must accept that there will be no justice. There'll be no future. And also without God, there'll be no significance to human life. It will have no value or direction or purpose. And in turn, our suffering just simply becomes meaningless. And yet the Bible reminds us that all of human life, made in the image of God, does have value and significance because God has made it that way. Luke 12, verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. How much more valuable you are than birds. So now we've begun to build a theology of suffering. And the first thing that we've said is that we must not deny that God exists just because there's suffering in this world. And and the second thing is we, we must accept that God allows suffering. As we've been saying, God does exist. He's a, a good God. He's a, a powerful God. And most importantly, he does have reasons for allowing suffering. But before we go any further, it's crucial that you and I understand that the Bible doesn't deny the reality of suffering. The Bible does not speak of this world where we live as a place where everything is perfect and pain-free. Rather, the Bible reveals and explores the pain of our sufferings. It doesn't try to hide it. it. doesn't try to gloss over it. It doesn't try to say, all is well when it's not well. For example, we see anger and frustration at injustice in Psalm 73, verse 12. This is what the wicked are like, always carefree, they increase in wealth. We read of anguish and desperation over painful personal experiences like childlessness. Genesis 30, verse 1, give me children or, or I'll die. The Bible speaks of loneliness. First Kings 19, verse 10, I am the only one left. There's grief over violence and war in Lamentations 3 verse 49. My my eyes will flow unceasingly without relief. There's tears at the loss of loved ones. John 11 verse 35, Jesus wept. Suffering, there's suffering from illness and sickness. Luke 8 43, a, a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And we don't have time to read from the Bible the list that includes murder of men and women, children and babies, along with rape and war and refugees, or dysfunctional families or the lame and lepers, or famine and hunger and cruelty and disease. And there's also floods and fires and earthquakes and storms, all the things that cause incredible suffering. And they're they're all here in the Bible. The Bible doesn't try to cover these things up. And so, friends, if the truth be knowing, suffering in this world should come as no surprise to the Christian. And yet that's not the way the world was meant to be. The Bible is very clear that God did not create a world of suffering. Genesis chapters 1 to 3 tell us that God had created the world and, and it was good. Suffering and evil were not part of that world. It was a world as it was truly meant to be. The kind of world that we really long for with all our hearts. A world with no sickness or suffering or hunger or pain or conflict or war. And to live in this good world that he had made, God had created people. And he called them good. In fact, humanity was the pinnacle of God's creation. In Genesis 1.31, we read that God saw all that he had made And he said it was very good. 
So God describes his creation as being very good. In Genesis chapter 2, he gave people, he had made a responsibility to look after all that was good, a freedom to enjoy all that was good. And so they had this choice to live under his rule, to enjoy life as it was designed to be lived, or they had the freedom to live their own way. The freedom to reject him, to rebel against him, and rebel against all that was good. Which is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. They deliberately and willfully and intentionally sinned against God. And the whole of humanity fell from goodness into sinfulness. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin, and in this way death came to all men. But why didn't God intervene? Why didn't he stop Adam and Eve from sinning? Why did God allow sin into his perfect world? Why did God even give Adam and Eve the choice to sin against him if he knew it would result in suffering for them, for the world, for the people in the world? Why? Well, the Bible tells us that God loves us. And in his love, he has created us with the ability freely to return his love. 1 John 4 verses 10 and 19, this is love. Not not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And you see, not to give us that choice would be like creating a robot. And as one Christian writer says, it is because God loves us that he gave us the dignity of that choice to simply return his love. And it's so easy for us to look at the suffering in the world and to blame God. And yet the truth of the matter is that humanity has taken the freedom and the responsibility they've been given and they have abused it. And so the result is rather than enjoying God's good world, we end up abusing it and hurting others. Okay, you might say people in the world have misused and abused all that God has given them, but I haven't. I've tried to do my best with what God has given me. I've tried to be a good steward of all that God has loaned me. So why doesn't God just get rid of those who are causing the suffering in the world? Why doesn't God just get rid of suffering and evil altogether and have done with it? As one Christian writer says, if you were God... Who would you get rid of? Corrupt governments, terrorists, dictators, greedy and unscrupulous chief executives? Would the world still be good? Then would you start on removing child abusers and murderers and rapists and drug dealers? Would the world really be an ideal place to live in? So who else would you begin to throw out? Petty thieves, hooligans, traffic wardens, you you know you want to. You see these telephone callers, you know you really want to. Would the world be a perfect place then? Who else would you have to get rid of to make this world a perfect place? Because you see, friends, if you keep going down that list, somewhere you will come to me and my family. And you'll come to you and your family. You see, we can hurt others by what we say and what we do. It's not only corrupt governments or evil dictators or criminals that can cause us pain and suffering because in this world that you and I are part of, we're also part of the problem. But of course we don't want God to get rid of us. Sure we don't. We want God to sort out this sinful, suffering world with all its evil, with all its harm, with all its hurt. But we don't want God to sort us out. In the passage we read from earlier, Luke records this terrible tragedy that has taken place. Some Galileans had been massacred by the Roman soldiers. In another incident, a tower in Siloam had simply collapsed, killing 18 people. So naturally, some people had come to Jesus to ask his opinion on what had happened. And Jesus is very clear. He's clear that suffering is not to be viewed as a specific punishment for sin. But he's also saying in that passage that we shouldn't think everyone is innocent either. The news media today reporting on such incidents will often talk about innocent victims. Jesus shockingly does not do the same. And his reply is in verses 1 to 5, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? 
Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell in them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, I tell you no. And what Jesus is saying here is that everyone living in Jerusalem at that time was guilty of sin. Those who died were not more guilty than anyone else, but they were guilty, as Jesus says, that you and I are guilty before God. And as we've been saying, we're all guilty of rebelling against a holy God of incredible goodness and grace. And when we die, we will find ourselves face to face with him. And and we all need to be ready for that moment. And that's why it's crucial. When disaster comes and suffering strikes us, that, that we are ready to have our lives taken from us. Friends, are you ready to have your life taken from you? Because whether it happens on a a COVID ward or in a sudden road traffic incident or or in the quietness of your own home or in the workplace or, or in a hospital bed, it will happen. The Bible is very clear, Job 1, 21, that the Lord gave, but also the Lord has taken away. And do you know what the words of Jesus were to the people that came to him seeking answers and comfort from the tragedies that had just happened? Jesus says in verse 5 of Luke 13, he says, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will perish. These are tough words, shocking words to say to people who are suffering, but they are are truthful words. And probably the most helpful words that that you will ever hear um, in all your life. And so, friends, I would urge you now, uh, today, in love with compassion, if you've not already done so, um, to repent before a loving and a holy God against whom we have all sinned. You see, the world and the church is full of people who think that, that basically we are all good people, good citizens whom God loves and we all deserve God's blessings. Whereas Jesus teaches here that all of humanity deserves the judgment of God. And we all need to turn from living our lives our own way and turn back to God in repentance and faith, receiving his Son as Saviour and and Lord of our lives. I wonder, friends, um, have you done that? Maybe today's your opportunity now, uh, as you're listening or later as you reflect on what you've heard. Either way, uh, today is the day of salvation. Uh, Don't put it off um, any longer. And yet, having said all that we have had said so far, what about the suffering in the world for which no one seems responsible? Who takes the blame for cancer, for Alzheimer's, for disabilities in life and disfigurements at birth? Who's responsible for earthquakes and tsunamis and floods? Well, the Bible tells us that sin and evil and suffering was not a part of God's creation. Isn't that what we're looking at earlier in Genesis? Satan, the devil, was not created evil. He was a good angel who has now fallen. Luke ten eighteen, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Satan tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God. and As they did, the whole of creation fell into sin and brokenness. And so, friends, when humanity rebelled against God, it had catastrophic consequences, not only for ourselves, but for the whole world that we live in. All of creation, including ourselves, bear the scars of sin. Romans 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So here's the truth. Living in a fallen, sinful, broken world affects every single one of us. And sometimes we'll suffer and there'll be no direct reason for it other than we're part of humanity and we live in a sinful, broken, fallen world. And for the time being, And we have to accept that. As painful as it is, it is the truth. Our first grandchild, Ella, died shortly after birth with a a rare genetic disorder. We have loved ones in our wider family circle whose children were born with disabilities. My own mother, a, a Christian for many years, suffered and died a very painful death due to cancer. And we all have our own stories of pain and suffering and heartache and disappointment And the Bible explains that all these things are evidence that we live in a world that has gone wrong. And and friends, I said again, this world we live in is broken. 
It is fallen, and at times it seems even unbearable. And when we ourselves suffer, or we have to watch loved ones or friends who suffer, we feel we want more than just answers. We just don't want the thing explained away. We want someone who understands us. We want someone who can enter into our pain and stand with us in it and walk with us through it. And here's the good news this morning. It's our third and our our, our final point. The Bible tells us that God has experienced suffering. The Bible is clear that God identifies with our suffering in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus entered into our world of flesh and blood. And he experienced all the disappointment and hurt and anguish and pain and suffering that we experience living in a broken, fallen world. And he also suffered in the most horrific way through his death on the cross. And so if we want to understand suffering, then then, then we must not deny that God exists. But we must accept that God allows suffering. And the best news of all, we declare that God has experienced suffering. But friends, let's not forget that Jesus and his experience of suffering has done simply more than just identify with our pain. One example a Christian writer gives is, if I meet you and you have a headache, without a headache myself, I I can't identify with your headache. Of course, I I could bang my head against a brick wall and, and, and get a headache, but I haven't done anything about your headache. All we have now are two headaches, one each. And you know, friends, if we're being honest when it comes to suffering, we want more than sympathy and empathy. We want to know that something can be done about it. And I want to say this morning that God has done something about it, about the suffering and brokenness and fallenness in this world. You see, the cross is God's answer to a suffering world. And dying on the cross, Jesus was not simply identifying with us in our suffering, He was dealing with the root cause of suffering, which is our sin and the sin and brokenness and fallenness of this world. And he took upon himself the sin and suffering and all that is wrong in this world, and he bore it upon himself, along with the punishment we all deserve, so that we could one day be free from the effects of sin and suffering forever and ever and ever. In the face of suffering and evil, the cross of Jesus is the greatest help and hope we could ever have. Friends, have you come to the cross? Have you come to the cross for salvation? Have you come and repented of your your sins against a holy God? Have you received the forgiveness of sins and, and the full assurance of salvation? I wonder if you come to the cross. And gazed into the eyes of Jesus as you place at the suffering, your suffering at the foot of the cross. But you know something? The truth of the matter is that the cross may not fully tell us why an all-powerful God would allow specific suffering in our lives. Yet it does show us what the answer is not. It cannot be that he does not love us. If God was willing to suffer and die on a cross for you and for me so that One day we could enter into his presence and be totally and completely free from suffering. Then you cannot say, because you're suffering now, that God does not love you. The Bible and the cross tell us that God does exist and he does love us. He does allow suffering in this world and our lives, but he's also experienced suffering. But one day God will end all suffering. And as we finish this morning, We do so declaring that suffering is not the end of the story. And the Bible gives us incredible hope that things will not always be the way as it is, as it points forward to the future. And here's the good news. The Christian will one day be free from suffering. The last book of the Bible, the conclusion to this world, is revealed to us. And friends, it is breathtaking. Revelation 21 Verses 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had had passed away. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. 
He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. What an incredible promise. And, and reading a description like that, someone has said, it's like smelling the aroma of a delicious meal when you're really, really hungry. Because we can only imagine and anticipate what it will be like. The suffering of this world is real. Of that, there is no doubt. It is painful. Of that, we can be sure. But it's not worth comparing with one day what God will bring about. He does exist. He does love us. He does allow suffering, but one day all suffering will end for those who know him and trust in him as Lord and Saviour. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. It's powerful. It brings to us that hope, that encouragement, and yet that incredible challenge to be ready and to meet you. Lord, we confess our wrestling over these issues of suffering and pain and hurt. And yet, when we come to the cross, we see in you this love that embraces us and focuses us back on you and the future. Lord, may we take your word to this hurting and, uh, and helpless and at times hopeless world and may we come to bring the truth of your word to the nations. May it be a healing word. May it be a saving word. May it be a restoring and renewing word through your spirit. In the power um, of your son. In whose name we pray. Amen. Evie is going to come again and, and lead us in worship.
what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good and for your glory you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good and for your glory you take what the enemy meant for Thank you to Evie for leading us in worship this morning and for Lorraine doing the, the technical side of things. We've certainly experienced something of the presence and the, the power of the Lord um, through his spirit and we trust um, you have also. Let, let, let's pray together. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that wonderful love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit um, come down upon us all, resting, remaining, and abiding with us this day and forevermore. Amen.